story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. Tonight, a father sticks around after death to keep his teenage son in check. Nap time isn't so relaxing for one listener. Hear why he never sleeps with his limbs hanging off the bed. Oh, great. This one I've gotten over that. Now we're going to hear Zing. Wonderful. <laughs> Can ghostly voices ever become just part of your job? We'll tell you a story of one man that was told to get used to it. An insane asylum holds many dark entities, but what happens when the cleaning crew provokes the spirits for a little entertainment those stories your calls and more on today's episode of real ghost stories online tony and jenny bruski joining you once again hello hello i uh i got an interesting message uh since yesterday's show and uh, i think it's been posted on our message board and i think he posted it on youtube as well this is a guy who's reversing our voices on youtube and thinking that he's getting uh hidden messages out of our show or something of that nature is he really thinking he's getting hidden messages well, or is he just analyzing it to hear the funny things well th- there is a i don't want to say a science to it but people there are some folks who do believe there is a science to this um, I've heard it, and it's something I heard years ago back on uh, Art Bell, um, and he had people on who were like analyzing, you know, president's speeches to this and that, real, you know, world-changing events. Okay. And then they'd reverse it, and then they claim to hear hidden messages out of it. So, what this uh, gentleman did was he he took pieces of one of our shows from the other day you know a real world changing event one of our shows sure <laughs> and and some of richard's calls and uh reverse them to try and get um see if you could hear other things and what's really interesting about it is um when you do reverse a voice um you can get um some fairly uh interesting sounds out of it that do remotely sound like a regular voice that sound like someone who's who's saying something uh, you know transversely it's not all you you know so some of the things he got were kind of crazy okay and i'm not calling this person crazy all i i applaud their dedication to our show and 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 putting this all out there um and and, and really looking into this but i mean i i listened to everything he he put together and it's like a playlist of i think like 12 different cuts from uh, some episodes and to me i didn't think anything really correlated to any sort of hidden message and that's kind of what some of this is where it's, it's supposedly what the subconscious is thinking when you're saying some of these things uh-huh. so i guess i can't speak for richard in chattanooga because i don't know what he's thinking when he's saying these things he's just telling his story for all we know um, but then he reversed some of my own, me saying things. Some of yours? And it's just, it's hilarious, really, to <laughs> say the least, um, for what some of the, the terms were. But here's here's some of them. I'm just going to play back uh, what some of the things that he got. This is um, uh, a playlist that he created. And this is the first one, I believe, Richard saying something. Funny. You know, funny. Here it is. Funny. Let's start from the beginning. Funny. That's the reversed audio. I heard we're funny. We're funny is what he's getting out of it. And here's the original cut. We're funny. So. Oh, to stop the car. Oh, now he, he's saying that I'm, I'm simply saying you're all kaputs. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> I don't think I've ever used the term kaputs in my life. No. Um, but that's, I guess, me saying stop the car. But in reverse, it's like you're all kaputs. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, and here's another one of me. He is sitting on Wheeler, Wheeler, we. He really, really wanted to see. Is he sitting on Wheeler, Wheeler, we? I guess is my hidden message there. <laughs> Very important message. Tony, you might understand this one, he says. I No, I, I don't. I, I really don't. He is sitting on Wheeler, Wheeler, we. <laughs> it just sounds really funny. Uh, that, that she, and she says that. Uh... 
So that that says my dad says she should, and that's in reverse. Okay. So that uh, interesting. Scared factor comes up to here's God's grace in reverse. Okay. Okay. He said, yeah, five years ago is in reverse, three and a half feet. This is like EVPs. It is. One more. No. <laughs> What not, is that? Not, this he says is me saying, hooray, she leaves here with your soul. That's great. And I guess my original statement was this. All sorts of ways for you to share. All sorts of ways for you to share is, hooray, she leaves here with your soul. That's great. Now, when I first heard that, I just burst out laughing. I'm like, <laughs> damn it, he caught me. How did anyone figure this out? I'm always hoping people steal each other's souls when listening to the show or become EP EVPs or whatever, or EPPs, whatever I was talking about there. But anyhow, um, interesting nonetheless. Um, he says, reverse speech was discovered by David Oates as an incredible technology, in my opinion, he says, with a smiley face. So I don't know if that's with a... Smile and a wink or not. Like EVPs, some reversals would be grade A, clear and easy to hear. A reversal might sound more clear than the front words clip, while some reversals will uh, you have to spin the words. And are more, uh, you have to do a little more creativity, but they're all still there. Uh, and they can be very enlightening. Um, I'll say they're a little bit clearer than EVPs, but I, I think probably even less relevant than an EVP, just because the... The human voice, I mean, you can say the same thing over and over, and it's going to say the same thing in reverse, you know, I guess depending on your accent. Um, you know, if I said, you know, the cat runs over the moon, and you said the cat runs over the moon, uh, you and I both don't have the same hidden meaning behind it, I guess, but it would sound exactly the same in reverse. Okay. You know what I mean? Right. So I, I, I just, I personally don't buy into it actually having anything, but it is interesting how you can make out some sensical statements out of a reverse word it reminds me of the bad lip reading youtube videos <laughs> it kind of is like that yeah uh, uh so anyhow thank you for for putting that together and thank you for sharing it gave us a good laugh um and paul is dead and paul is indeed still dead yes 855-853-4802 is the phone number to call into real ghost stories online if you'd like to share a real ghost story with us and hopefully you can share your ghost story with us the front way and then we can play it in reverse and get a whole second ghost story out of it. <laughs> it's gonna be it's like we're gonna recycle the stories a little bit here uh again 855-853 Five three forty eight zero two is the phone number to call in uh, to our show. Let's go out to a caller who called in on that very phone line. Hi. Hey, Tony. This is MTR, also known as Nat the Rat. I do my own podcast with myself, a part of Rat House Productions. That's what I run. If you guys want to check it out, go on ahead. But I just want to call because I have several ghost stories. I'm going to start off with this one. I just got hired at the, a very famous theme park. I live over here in Southern California. If you guys could uh, possibly guess where it was. Uh, I ended up get, just getting hired into this place, and my buddy and I, guy I knew from elementary school, who just ended up being at the same college, and from there we ended up getting hired at the theme park. Uh, we decided to go in, just got hired, and I get free access. So we go in, and there's this all you can eat buffet back behind by a ranch. So we go to um, the buffet, and we end up eating, and after I get done eating, you know, need to take care of business. So I end up going and taking care of business, and I'm a greedy kind of person. I like to take the handicap stall, even though I'm not. So I'm taking care of business, and I see these pair of feet come up and knock really aggressively against the door of the stall. And I'm like, to my buddy, his name is David. I go, David, what do you want? He's like, what time does the park close? I go, I don't know what time the park closes. Like, you're the one that's been working here longer than me. You should know. Well... How much your ticket? I go, why are you asking me these stupid questions right now? Just hold on, let me get done, and we'll talk. So I end up in a hurry, getting out, washing my hands, and my buddy walks in and goes, hey, dude, like, it's been taking a long time. I go, dude, why are you coming up in here asking me stupid questions while I'm taking care of business? I, I like to be alone and do what I need to do. Just leave me be. Like, yeah, I didn't come in here 
I didn't come in here and ask you anything. Like, Whatever, dude. Thinking he's playing a prank on me. About three months later, I end up doing my job at a, uh, at the theme park, my normal day. I go, uh, the buddy that I'm working with asked me, hey, man, what time, uh, what time is it? And I go, it, it's about five minutes till park closing. And he's like, all right, dude, don't go back by that bridge. And I go, why? He's like, dude, it's haunted over there. I go, whatever, man. Like, I've never had any experiences over there, so I, I call bull. He's like, no, I swear to you, man, you go over there, and there ends up being a guy while you're in the middle of working. You're not facing him, but he asks you, what time does the park close and how much tickets are? If it's a cartoon, my jaw would have hit the floor, man. I kid you not, it just, it was one of the weirdest stories that I've ever had. I got a couple more at that park, and I got a couple more that have just happened to me in general. So keep on listening, you guys. Thanks a lot. Wow. I would be I would be so paranoid to go to the bathroom anywhere in that park now. Not just over by the bridge, but just anywhere. I hate when people knock on your stall, you know? And it's kind of like, what? You can't see my feet under here? I I too sometimes take the handicapped stalls just because there's more it's more spacious. And they're usually clean. Well, they're usually the cleaner of the stalls. I do when the girls are with me just so they don't have to stand like out in the open and I'd sure. rather have them in there with me and that way there's actually room to turn around or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how long do you think that park is? And I'm assuming we're all speaking of Disneyland here. That's my guess. Okay. He hasn't confirmed it. That's my assumptions, but I don't know. My guess is either that one or Knoxbury Farm. Sure. Yeah, it could be either one. Um, how haunted do you think those parks are? Do you think they're haunted? I mean, because if I was a ghost, it actually would be a fairly decent place to haunt. If you wanted to go have fun, go check out people, well, you know, watch people, screw with people, um, and just, you know, be entertained, you know, on a fairly daily basis. If just either, you know, if you don't want to screw with people, just go check things out. Theme parks would be a great place to haunt if you can choose where you're going to go. I'd probably go more for Disney World, though, because there's a lot more around that area. You know, you got the Magic Kingdom, you got Epcot, you got all the other things around there. Um, and you could mess with animals, too, at the, uh, the, all the, the, animal, the animal Kingdom. Animal Kingdom, yeah, yeah. You got a lot of things you can haunt there. Um, but just assuming if you could haunt a place, that would be a, not a bad option. Well, I'm guessing probably pretty haunted, just because... Well, think of how old it is, but then also a theme park is a source of a lot of emotion changes, you know, sure. from either being scared on a ride to just extreme happiness because you're at that theme park. Yeah. So I would think that that would be a place that would be frequented a lot. I wonder, that's a good question to throw out there for our listeners. How haunted are theme parks? Maybe there's more folks out there who work at them or have experience, uh, you know, with stories along that line. It'd be really interesting to hear more stories of haunted theme parks. Seems like a great place for a haunt. Well, I wonder if it has anything to do with the Bones and the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. Is that at the in the, the California one? I believe that is at Disneyland, which is in California. Okay. That They've since replaced all but, like, one of the skulls, but they originally bought the skeletons from one of the schools mm -hmm. there that where they used actual skeletons to yeah. teach and they used that for some of the you know the props in the pirates of the caribbean ride sure not even making that up no i i believe you i mean it's like how they used to use cadavers as for the princesses um you know and <laughs> okay <laughs> sleeping beauty was really a cadaver <laughs> they laid her down and put all the makeup on it that's great. <laughs> Tell that to the girls. Yeah. What's a cadaver? Uh, Aaron writes in, Well, I've always been extremely fascinated by everything and anything supernatural. I've always had an equal skepticism to counterbalance that. This couldn't explain why I've never truly experienced anything otherworldly, or any encounters with ghosts for that matter, except possibly for one incident I've experienced when I was 15 years old. I'm not truly sure if what I experienced was supernatural, but I'm at a loss as to why this event truly occurred. On February 1st of 1999, my father died after a two-year-long battle with uh, metho... I cannot say this. Mesothelioma. Thank you. I'm, it's a big word, and it's. I know... I can hear it in my head, but I can't say it out loud. 
just like the commercial mesothelioma. Okay, there we go. Uh, an extremely volatile and uh, terminal cancer. As the months leading up to his death passed, I quickly saw my father deteriorate from a very robust and strong man to a frail and skeletal figure. For the last two or three months he was alive, my father was bedridden. It wasn't long until he was reduced to eating, shaving, or even using the bathroom without stamping a foot on the ground. Needless to say, my father had to be very literally waited on hand and foot, with me being in my first year of high school, and with my stay-at-home mom, the only person in our house to take care of my father, it was hard to be with him 24-7, even when hospice care or other family members were over to help. To somewhat help with my father's needing care, he asked for us to get him a hand-sized bell that he could ring whenever he needed something. He jokingly thought of this as the best way for him to feel like a king, which proved that even close to death, my father was still mentally the strong-willed man I'd look up to all my life. About a week after he died, I was watching TV and doing some homework on my mom was cleaning up some things around the house. Now, our family room where I was watching TV is located directly across from our basement door, and the TV itself faces out of the room and towards the basement door. This meant that I was facing away from the basement door and into the family room. My mom was in the basement and called up to me and asked me to help her with moving some stuff. Now, from th where I was sitting, I wasn't able to tell if she was calling me upstairs or from the basement. I told her I'd help her during the commercial break. About five minutes later, I heard my dad's bell start chiming. Now again, I had no idea where in the house my mom was at the time, so when I heard the bell, I thought it was her way of telling her lazy 15-year-old son to get a move on. I figured she was in her bedroom cleaning out some of my father's old things. Got up, ascended the stairs. When I got to the upstairs landing, the entire upstairs was dark. Both my mother and father were stern people when they needed to be, but uh, naturally lighthearted, so I thought maybe she was having a bit of fun with me. However, I was feeling a little uneasy and unsure why. When I got to my parents' room, the door was wide open, and I entered in slowly, thinking my mom was going to jump out and scare me. That's when I noticed my father's bell on his side of the bed, lying on its side where his chest would have been. He was lying there. It was at that moment when I heard my mom's voice from far away in the basement yelling up to me, Hurry the hell up! Needless to say, I ran all the way downstairs and helped my mom. I told her it, uh, about it a couple days later, and my mom, who somewhat believes in ghosts, thought it was my father keeping me in check. Though it's pretty evident that it couldn't have been my father. It couldn't have been my. It could have been my father coming back to keep me in line. I've always been unsure exactly as to the true explanation of what happened, and although I'll always hold a skeptic opinion as to the true explanation of things. I always hold a sort of romanticism for the experience I had uh, as a scared 15-year-old young boy who had just lost his father the week before. As a side note, I recently moved out of my mom's house with my girlfriend of three and a half years. I had stayed in that house for as long as I could with my mother since I was all she had left after my father had died. This was why for the last year my girlfriend offered to live in my mom's house with me so it may be easier on my mother when we finally did move. During that year, though, my girlfriend confessed to hearing strange noises coming from the room next to ours, which was the guest bedroom for the house. I should make note that during my father's last days, we had moved him in there for easier access to the stairs, and that was indeed the room that he died in. When I did tell my girlfriend this fact after she had these experiences. She was convinced that my father still haunts my mom's house to this date. She was also quite relieved when we moved out. I do have another story involving two of my half-sisters, two of my father's daughters of a previous marriage, and a Ouija board they supposedly contacted the spirit of my father with on two occasions, but I'll save that for another time. Thanks for reading my story, Tony. All the best, and thanks for such a wonderful podcast, Aaron. I'm guessing that it is the dad because it sounds like it's pretty harmless and activity that he would have done. Yeah. Um, in that case, I think so. I, yeah. I'd be interested to hear the Ouija story. Okay. To see what exactly happened there because I think more times than not when you're trying to contact your loved one on the Ouija board, you're not getting your loved one. Yeah. You may think you're getting your loved one, but I don't know. I mean, let's let's hear the story. Those are so hard to prove, though, You know, either way. And it's not that we're out to prove anything, but it's just... 
it, it's usually not. That's usually not how the stories end if they continue to go on beyond that one Ouija session. Sure. You know, where it's like, oh, it was dad, and then we talked, and next thing you knew, we were seeing shadow people around the house, you know? <laughs> right. It's like, so, 855 uh, 853 is a phone number to call into Real Ghost Stories Online. Hey, if you're not an EPP yet, please consider becoming one. Being an EPP keeps our show alive. So if you enjoy the show, you'd like it to continue onward into the new year, uh, become an EPP. That's what's going to keep it going. And uh, the more you we have, the bigger, the better the show we can give you and keep it a going. Five bucks a month, or you can do the yearly option, and it just gets debited you know, once a year then. And you get all the uh, 52 bonus episodes sent to you uh, every single week. A new one comes out. So please consider uh, supporting the show if you enjoy it. Like I said, that's what keeps us a going. Uh, you can go real storiesonline.com. Again, the number 855 853 4802. If you have a real ghost story, yes. Hi, Tony and Jenny. This is Allie calling. Um, I just wanted to first off thank you guys so much for sharing my first two stories and video on the air. Um, that was really amazing and uh, was just so cool to hear the playback. So thank you so much. I wanted to call in because uh, I have so many good stories and I just, you know, really wanted to share some more with you. I thought you guys would really enjoy that. And the story I wanted to share today was back in the time, um, I had a friend who used to work for one of the large theme parks in Orlando. She's one of my very, very close friends. She was a little empathic herself and uh, a little bit psychic and we just, we get along really, we just click very, very well. And uh, one day she asked me if I would wanted to go to the park with her and meet up with one of her friends who was visiting and his son. I said, great, let's go. And um, she was able to get us in. We met him at the gate, and this was the first time I ever met Sam. She introduced us to each other. It was fantastic. Her, and his son as well, Jackson, and, you know, just got off to a great start. And I reached out to shake his hand and help him, you know, get across the turnstiles to get into the big theme park. And I shook his hand. And this woman came in, stood in front of me, and said, tell him thank you, and flew out. And I was a little taken aback by this. I almost felt like she had possessed me or come into me in some way, but I felt her leave, so I knew she was gone. And, you know, I just sincerely held his hand and dropped it and was a little stunned and didn't know what to say. And, you know, we went about our day. We went back into the theme park. We had a great time. And... He and his son, at the end of the day, went back to their hotel, and I was left with my friend, and she said to me, you know, I'm glad you had a great day, but you looked a little stunned when you met my friend there. Um, what happened? So I told her the story. I said, you know, there's this older woman, this lady. She came in and told me to tell him thank you and left. And I didn't really know what to do with that information because I didn't know anything about this man. I didn't want to relay that I was a psychic. I usually keep that pretty private. So, you know, I didn't want to let him in on the story and what had just happened. And she nods and with an understanding smile and says, hey, do you mind? Do you mind if I share this story with him? I said, no, not at all. If you feel that he'd be open to that, please go right ahead. Maybe there is a message for him that I just didn't get across. So we separate, go our own two ways, and reconnect later. And she says, hey, remember, you remember that story that you told me about what happened when you met my friends? I said, yeah, I do. Well, turns out this man was a pastor, or is a pastor in his hometown in Ohio, a very influential man. And he had actually, just the week before, if not even the weekend before, had helped an older woman to cross over peacefully and with respect. And there had been some controversy and some issues with family surrounding her death. And uh, when I had described what this lady looks like to my friend, Christine, um, the descriptions just matched up and everything just seemed to work out, you know, perfectly to this woman that had passed away with the exception of getting a name or anything. So she said, I really touched this man and I didn't even get to relay my story. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, just the experiences that can happen on a positive note as well as on a, you know, creepy negative note. That was kind of a, I guess, a good possession, if you will, or a good interaction with a spirit um, that I've had. And I've had many of those types of encounters, but this one just really stands out to me because it just panned out later. And it was just so 
unique and you could just tell that this person that had the message was so grateful and just really wanted to get that message across to the man that helped her pass. So pretty impressive, pretty amazing stuff. Anyway, I just wanted to share that story and I hope it made sense. Thank you guys so much for the great show. I tune in every day. I listen to you guys all the time. I love it. All the stories are fantastic and everyone that calls in is amazing to hear. You guys you know, make my work day just a little bit uh, more bearable, move a little bit quicker, and uh, I just love hearing these stories. And, Jenny, I just keep up what you're doing. You're so sensitive and so psychic, and it's beautiful to see. And, Tony, your encouragement in that is amazing. It reminds me a little bit of my personal relationship between my boyfriend and I, and it's just it's so fantastic and encouraging to see. And I love, I just love chatting with you guys and hearing you guys get on the air. Can't say enough good things. Anyway, I won't keep you any longer, but thanks so much for sharing my story. And uh, I'll call back with more later. All right. Have a great day. Bye. Okay. I need a small bit of clarification. She said the woman just came in and then went out. I mean, does that mean like she, did she actually see someone go in front of her and say this and then she ran away or was this like, kind of like she felt this energy then said this and then it went away what what did you take of that or maybe i'm missing a piece i think she either physically saw her there or she saw her in her mind which we know that sometimes um sensitives especially ones that can see people that have already passed on sure they can either see them you know fully standing there just like you or me or they they see it in their, you know, it almost like literally pops into their head. So, in their mind's eye. Yeah. So one of those two ways was how she saw this person. Okay. That makes more sense. I mean, that, that's what I was assuming. I just, I wasn't quite clear if it was like, because she said she popped in. I'm like, does that mean she'd like just, hey, tell them thank you. Okay. I'm going to go over to Splash Mountain now, you know. Right. Or how that exactly <laughs> worked. Um, but okay. Okay. I mean, either way, it doesn't really make it. Anyway. Um, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of like, uh, who was it? Cisco? Was it Mary? Who, who was having those stories where they were like the woman who came up to her in, uh, the Japanese couple that, that came up, uh, to her. Oh, the gentleman that, that passed away yeah. in the tsunami. That was Mary's story. Oh yeah. That was Mary's. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. she, she could see them. I think that she could actually see them, see them like they would show sure. up. But it, I mean, it was similar. I mean, whether right. they showed up or not, but she was like, she could get this information. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. All right. Thank you for the call. Thank you for the story. 855-853-4802 is the phone number to call in to Real Ghost Stories online and share your real ghost story with us. Uh, let's go to another letter from the website. Nick writes in, hi, I'm from Clovis, California, but a mile away. From the Wolf Manor. What's the Wolf Manor? I don't know. Okay. My story takes place when I was in high school. I'm assuming it's a haunted house is my guess. I'm guessing so too. I'm not quite sure, but I'm going to guess so. Okay. Considering the topic of our show. (laughs) That'd be a good guess. (laughs) My story takes place when I was in high school about 10 years ago in the house I live in today. Though I have a few terrifying encounters, I only post one today. I just got back from school and I went into my room to take a nap. My room is built uh, on... uh, My room is a build on in the garage and has no windows. Or build on in the garage. I get it. Um, So it's perfect for afternoon naps. Well, I laid down with my dog tiny, an American pit bull, and turned my TV off so I could rest. Now, my room is pitch black. I mean, no light at all. As I lay down, I fell asleep with my arm dangling off the bed. I'm woken up by a person lifting my arms up and laying it on my chest. At first, I'm not alarmed because from the touch, it felt like a female's hand, and I presumed it was my mother's until I remembered I locked my door before I went to bed. That's when I tried to get up to figure out who was in my room, and I was pinned to my bed. And all I heard was children's laughter. Then the children's laughter became deeper, until it was a demonic laugh. This is about the time my dog started barking. I started yelling, God help me. Then the demon said in perfect English, your God can't help you now. I felt like I was being possessed, like it was entering my vessel and it was winning. Then I said, Jesus, help me. And it stopped. I jumped out of bed. The TV was on a static channel, full volume. 
and my dog was freaking out and barking on my bed. I sprinted out of the room with Tiny chasing close behind me, and I ran into the living room to yell at my mother, there's a demon in my room. She laughed hysterically and told me uh, that there's nothing in your room. It's all a bad dream. I'll tell you what, I'm almost 30 now, and I can tell the difference between a dream and reality, and this happened. I still can't sleep with my limbs hanging off my bed. Thank you, I really enjoy the show. This is just one encounter. I have many more, but this is one that gives me chills every time I think about it. So I heard a different story when I was a kid about hanging an arm off the bed. Yeah, and... they get eaten by monsters. Well, not exactly. And this was probably an urban legend, but it creeped me out. But this kid like hung an arm or a leg over the bed and felt something licking it and just assumed it was the family dog Uh huh. until it rolled over and the family dog's on the bed with him. So what was licking it? Who knows? Isn't that gross? That's disturbing. Yep. The licking ghost. I, uh, aside from the, uh, possession part of that story, um, I, I wouldn't be so freaked out by, you know, something moving my arms back onto me. Um, I was always afraid, like, someone's going to yank me off the bed, like, grab my leg or grab my arm and then eat it or pull me down or, you know. Okay. You always, you always hear those stories, you know. Tragedy strikes today in Tulsa, Oklahoma, as three children's arms are ripped from their body as they're sleeping by the monster under their bed. Yeah, you hear that all the time. Weather next. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of how it goes. Um, but uh, that was always my fear. Totally rational. I, 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 I'm kind of envious of uh, his room where he said it's like completely pitch black with no uh, windows. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I get the best sleep in rooms like that. Like Bruce and we had the inside cabin with no windows. Uh -huh. That was great. Yeah, couldn't see anything, and it was just sleep. I tried creating that once in an apartment that I had, and unfortunately, it was uh, the apartment was on the corner of the building, so it wasn't just like one window. It was like window here, window on each wall. So it got pretty bright. Sure. And even like the curtains I was putting up, still it still kept it pretty bright. And I worked nights, so it really sucked because. I was sleeping pretty late into the day because um, I would go to work at like seven or eight o'clock at night and I wanted it dark. So I put, the, I did the, uh, the tin foil. Cause oh. that always looks so nice from the outside. It was an apartment building. I didn't care. Okay. You know, and, um, and it, I mean, yeah, it looked horrible, uh, <laughs> but I got so many questions like, what are you doing in there? <laughs> <laughs> I think people thought I was like growing weed or something. <laughs> Probably. And now watching Trailer Park Boys, uh, I'm like, oh, I guess I, that makes kind of some sense there. Um, <laughs> but, but at the time, I had no, I didn't even, I didn't know how to do that. I never have done that. But I mean, that was like the last of, thing on my mind. It was more so just that was all I could think of to really block everything out without buying really expensive shades, which I did not have the money to do. Sure. So the cheapest I could do was, you know, a little rental trap. And it seemed <laughs> to work out fairly well. It's just everyone thought I was doing drugs or, you know, selling them or distributing them out of there. But eh, that was not the case. 855-853-4802. Uh, That's the phone number to call in to us here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Let's go to another caller. Hi. Hi, Tony and Jenny. This is John from Virginia again. Um, got another story. Uh, I called a little while back, but um, I travel a lot and maybe um, i call didn't go through or something but i've been looking forward to hearing uh, a response to uh some questions about shadow people that i had um but anyway my story is um uh, from a few years back um i had a close friend that lived at a lake and his father owned a marina there and uh the story goes that uh the marina was haunted so uh they had a uh challenge for everybody that you know, kind of younger around the area that you couldn't make it a whole night in the marina, uh, which was kind of a boathouse type of a thing, all night by yourself or with a friend uh, because it was so haunted. And uh, if you could make it, then you got $100. So $100 to uh, a young uh, starving musician was a uh, formidable offer to go try out uh, our bravery in a haunted marina. 
Uh, of course, we didn't know any backstory or anything. We figured it was just an urban legend, and his dad was actually the one putting up the money. So we were like, okay, we'll, we'll do this. So uh, actually a friend of mine and uh, and the guy that, that uh, son that owned the marina and myself all went and we set up camp, uh, brought some sleeping bags, uh, brought a uh, small radio, uh, a couple of uh, th thermals uh, with some soup in it and uh, some water and a couple of um, battery powered lanterns and just kind of sat in uh, in the top of this old marina that had been shut down uh, where they used to sell gas and food and candy and things and uh, decided to camp out and we made it through most of the night nothing eventful happened we ended up trying to tell each other stories to freak each other out to see if someone would leave and of course we didn't so we ended up getting bored playing cards and just hung out and about three or four that morning we woke up to a sound. It wasn't something outside of the marina. It wasn't the waves smacking against the side of the boats or the buoys or, or anything like that. It wasn't an animal. It was kind of strange. So I, it lulled me out of my sleep, kind of uh, groggily looking around at what I could see uh, in the room, which was pitch black. Uh, everyone had turned out there their lights and uh, I didn't want to risk waking anyone else up by turning on my light. So I just kind of laid there looking at the ceiling trying to figure out what it was. And the sound would would be a doom, doom, doom. It would be a whoosh and then a thud and a whoosh and a thud and a whoosh and a thud and a whoosh and a thud and it was driving me crazy and I'm going what is the sound what is going on you know where you know somebody's messing with it gotta be someone messing with it. so I woke the other guys up so guys can you hear this my friend Scott said, yeah I hear it what is it you know it's got to be a boat or something a buoy you know something and Richard the the gentleman who father on the marina he said yeah it's it's nothing go back to sleep and then he heard it and then he was freaked out he's like gosh look, you know what is that and i don't know so we tried turning on one of the lanterns it didn't work we tried turning on the second lantern didn't work we tried the third lantern did not work we had brand new batteries in these things it wouldn't work we tried the radio because it had a light on it did not work so then my friend uh, Scott started fumbling through his um, bag to try to find the lighter. We found the lighter. We lit the lighter, and we saw a T-shirt that um, that my friend Scott had taken off before he went to sleep um, slide across the wall and hit the, the, the corner, and then it would go up the wall and slide all the way to the adjacent wall and fall and then it would do it all the way around the room just making a perfect square swoosh thud, swoosh thud. so it freaked us all out we ran out of the place you know screaming like little girls <laughs> the next morning we woke up um you know it was just a few hours later actually to uh um the man who owned the marina cutting grass so we woke up and uh, kind of stumbled out, and he laughed at us for, for not being able to make it a night in there. And we told him what had happened, and he said, well, that's pretty creepy. And um, he was kind of disturbed by it, and uh, he stopped mowing, and he took us all inside, and he told us that the reason why he had shut down the marina years ago is because a small boy uh, was playing around the docks when someone was gassing up their boat and he actually uh, fell in between a boat and the, and the dock and got underneath the dock and the waves were coming in and, and pushed the boat against the dock and he couldn't get out. He got trapped. And as he was trapped, he was going around the edges of the dock trying to find a way out and he couldn't and he ended up drowning. And uh, it was such a devastating thing to the area and to the marina and to 
uh, everyone that was involved, he decided to shut down the marina and not sell gas or food or anything anymore because he didn't want to risk anything like that ever happening again. He was visibly very shaken by it and uh, came to tears and and, um, and asked us to uh, to lock up, to get our things and lock up the place and that, and that he wasn't going to allow anyone to go back up there anymore. Um, so uh, we were really, really freaked out. I didn't sleep for for a few days because um, every time I would close my eyes, I could I could hear and and see uh, that T-shirt. Um, so anyway, that's probably one of my m- most freaky things that's ever happened to me. Uh, paranormal, ghostly uh, type of thing. Uh, the other instances that I've had have been actually kind of friendly and nice and helpful. Uh, but uh, anyway, I hope you like the story. I uh, hope to hear the other stories soon, hopefully, so I can get some advice about what to do. And um, if you like the story, let me know, and uh, I've got a few more. Uh, thanks, guys. I really appreciate the show. Love it. And I'll talk to you soon. I want to hear the good stories. I mean, that was a good story, but I want to hear the happier stories. Did he say he wrote in or called in in the past and he hasn't heard his call back? Because if he had not heard his call back yet, uh, that means that either the call never went through, because I don't have any previous calls from him. Sure. Um, there have been a couple calls that I've I've listened to briefly, and the audio quality was so poor, like the cell phone's cutting in and out, that I just dumped them. Uh-huh. Because you can't use it you can't listen to it so that that may have been one of those calls where i was like damn this sounds like it could be a really good story but then it just was an unusable call um so sir if if you called in your story in the past and you've not heard it on the air yet uh please do call your story back uh chances are your cell phone just or whatever you were calling from uh delivered really bad quality and we just couldn't use the call so feel free to to share your story that is creepy it is very the creepy. thud because that's essentially like what like the the kid bobbing against the building. Yeah, that's making yeah. that noise, but I sure. think that's what the noise represented. Yeah, then it's creepy. Eight five five eight five three forty eight zero two is the phone number to call into Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost story with us. Here's a letter. Melissa writes, you know, I was listening to your Ghosts of the Queen Mary episode that you posted on 922. You were talking about people who work in cemeteries or funeral homes. My dad works for a landscaping business here in San Diego, California, and part of his work is working in a cemetery. They clean up the yard, dig grave sites, and occasionally lower coffins into the ground. There's a landscaping... (laughs) That's a little bit more than I think was in the original job description. Yeah. (laughs) They can also make you one hell of a zinnia bed. There you go. (laughs) One day, while taking lunch in the middle of the yard, he hears an elderly woman sobbing. He thought nothing much of it, since people do come and do that. Uh, As her crying continued, he started to look around to see if he can spot her. There was nobody nearby at all. The caretaker of the cemetery was also eating lunch with my dad's group and noticed that my dad was looking around. The caretaker basically said to pay no attention to it. She eventually goes away. She always appears and sobs at this time of the day. He was obviously talking about a crying ghost. My dad tried to keep calm and asked the caretaker, what the hell? The caretaker is so used to seeing and hearing strange things around that it got to the point of it not bothering him anymore, the caretaker said. If you want to hear something really sad, go over to the children's part of the yard. You can clearly hear a young girl crying, to which my dad play, playfully said, screw you, I'm not that crazy. So many crazy things happened to my dad starting from a very early age. Keep up the good work. Look forward to future shows. There's no way I could just be like, we'll get used to it. Or be told to just get used to it. Yeah, there's the children crying over there. There's the lady here. It's no big deal. Is that ham and cheese? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. 855-853-4802. That's her number. Jake writes in, I guess I should start by giving you some background before going into any of the details. I used to clean a building that once upon a time was an insane asylum. It is now a place where children go if they have learning difficulties. The building was opened in the 1820s as a mental hospital. 
I find it funny that they called them hospitals when they would treat homosexuality with electric shock therapy. But regardless, it stayed open until 1853. It then became a psychiatric facility until about 1985 when it was closed down and became what it is in its present day. The creepiest thing being that you would walk in and you would be standing in the corridor with the cells, now offices, all along the wall straight in front of you. The floor was wooden and was battered through the years and years of hard use. The offices were cells with desks and computers in them. Not a single thing had changed. The doors were thick, solid, and heavy with a metal peephole cut in the middle. A heavy iron inlay was in the corner of every room with a hoop attached. It served as a horrible reminder that when tied up and fearing their treatment would drive them to madness if not already. I would first like to say that I'm six foot two and have studied mixed martial arts for a number of years, so I know that I can take care of myself. But in some of those offices, I would be shaking. Not because I saw any shadow people, but I could feel something dark crawling at the inside of my head, screaming, just scraping away at my sanity with every blood-curdling scream. This wasn't out loud, but inside my head. I would clean the shit up and be out of there like you wouldn't believe. So I would go into the next room, feel almost sad and just at a loss with everything I was feeling, so much empathy for something I couldn't see. And it was the strangest thing. Then we got to where we were now, the woman's toilets. I felt so sick walking into that room. Chills would run up my spine and shake me to my core. It was so cold. I'm a fairly big guy and whatever that was in there intimidated me and belittled me. I could feel a horrible lurking presence in my face everywhere I was in that room. Something so aggressive and angry at the world. Even my own man would hate being, even my old man would hate being in there, even if it was just for a minute or two. There were so many emotions in that building that you would walk out feeling so drained. Feeling, feelings are all well and good, but that's all they are. You can't really base things on that. This is where my story takes a bit of a twist. I and my dad would do this particular job at around 1 to 2 a.m., nice and dark by then. And being a father and son, it was our duty to scare each other by jumping out from a corner or something along those lines. We walked in. I was feeling brave and stupid. And I shouted, I want to play tonight, boys and girls. You must be in need of some entertainment. Well, I asked and, God damn it, they replied. Before we could stumble through the thick darkness, every single monitor in the building came on. My dad was calling me a thick shit. The shutters on the peepholes slid shut, in order, starting from the furthest away to the heaviest boot footstep that seemed to hit the floor like a slow stroll. In my mind, it seems like it was a warden or a doctor doing their nightly checks. Being stubborn and with a job to do, we pretended like we couldn't hear anything and began to carry out our routine. At the end of one of the corridors, there was a large meeting room, a very large room with no windows. Make your own minds up about that one. A big oval-shaped table surrounded by chairs sat in the middle of the room. Now on this side of the building, the lights were still off. I looked into the room on my way to the switches, which were conveniently placed at the end of the lovely darkness that filled every millimeter. I must apologize if people listening are thinking, he's using a lot of words to describe darkness. But it wasn't just darkness. If you can imagine filling a room with that much negativity and evil, it would be blacker than black, almost like you'd have to wade through it to reach your desired location. So the lights came on after a few but clenching moments of the lights flickering to notice that all of the chairs were placed on the table. Some were stacked on top of each other. I didn't hear a thing, not a single thing, pure silence. There was a grand old mirror behind the table and mounted on the wall... This next part scares me so bad even writing it I can feel tears in my eyes. Not out of sadness, but through fear. A man, black as a night, completely featureless, my height, his arms crossed in gentle black mist that seemed to caress his slender figure came walking out of one of the offices. It was a walk, not crawling along the walls or any exorcist shit, 
I could see him in the mirror getting closer and closer, but I just couldn't avert my eyes. I couldn't speak or move. I just found myself standing there hopeless with a pole from Henry Hoover in my hand. I couldn't feel... I could feel that screaming in my head again. And as it was filling with those blood-curdling screams, shaking me to the core, I was so angry. My dad would have walked into the room I was in and would have ripped his heart out. A cold, pure rage ran through my veins. The more I stared into that mirror, I stopped seeing that thing behind me and averted my eyes back to my own reflection. I was snow white. My eyes were green. They were now black. The whites of my eyes so bloodshot. I looked like Satan himself. I shouted so hard and loud, all I could taste was blood. My dad came running down the corridor completely unaware. He ran over to me as I dropped my, to my knees with exhaustion. He pulled me out of there like he was going through his basic training again. We left our equipment and all the lights on, locked the door. My dad collected it the next day in the early afternoon. As for me, I slept for two days and two nights, waking up for 30 minutes here and 30 minutes there to eat and to use the throne. Never gone back to that hellish place and never intend to. If people are worrying that it has latched onto me after that experience, I haven't had anything follow me. My grandma is a hard ass and I believe she's looking down on me, keeping bad shit away. A couple things to take away from this tale. Number one, don't be a dipshit and antagonize things you have no clue about. Even if you do have a clue, I wouldn't recommend it. Number two, if you find yourself in an insane asylum, ghosts are already nice and pissed off. Make sure your work partner, and in my case my dad, isn't in a completely different part of the building jamming to Johnny Cash. Again, a huge hello from England. Thank you for your time, guys. You're just spiffy. Cheers, Jake. I don't have a lot to say about his story, but I love the way he writes. Yeah. Jake, I think you're pretty spiffy, too. Yeah, you are. Yeah. I would love to hear more stories if you got any, Jake. But that's uh, that's interesting. It's almost like, like where it takes him over. He saw that transformation, whether it was actually physical or just something that was manifesting itself in the mirror. And kind of reminiscent of, you know, amityville or something there, but just dark. Great story. Great story. So, Jake, please do write in again uh, if, uh, if you got some more stories. We would love to hear them. Our phone number is 855-853-4802. That's the number to call into us here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Let's go to another caller here. Hey, Tony. This is David calling from Oregon. Uh, really uh, like your program. Just discovered it. Um, would like to tell you a story um, that is absolutely factual and true. It occurred to me. Um, I've had numerous, numerous experiences in my 51 years, but uh, some a little bit more dramatic than others. But this one is a subtle, was a subtle message from my mother, letting me know she was still um, amongst us here, uh, amongst us here in the living world after she had passed away. Um, she passed away in August of uh, 2000, and. Um, when she passed away for the last six months of her life, she'd been living with my sister and brother-in-law who were doing a wonderful job of taking care of her and making her comfortable in her room that they had set up for her. It was a very nice place for her to spend the last uh, several months of her life. And after she had died, um, she was 71 years old, and um, I was uh, out of state, and I came back to where I was living at the time, where our family was living at the time in Colorado, and I... Uh, was at my brother-in-law and sister's house and we we're talking about my mother and uh how we know she's in a better place and she was a very spiritual person and my sister mentioned to me that uh, the last the day of my mother's life um while her uh, health was degrading um it was obvious that she was about to pass and i was trying to get to colorado um she indicated she said to my sister that um you'll know that i'm around because i will send you messages and one message i will send you our dimes is a dime. When you find a dime, you'll know that uh, I'm here and I'm uh, I'm with you. And um, if anyone would make attempt, an attempt from another side, if you will, to make a message clear, it would be my mother. 
And uh, so we, we all settled with that, and we all knew that, that that would be the case. Well, this was about a week after she had she had passed away, and I was um, staying with my sister and brother-in-law for a few days before I, my relocation to Oregon. And uh, I was sleeping in my what had been turned into my mother's room downstairs um, it was its own room, sort of in a split-level home on the floor, uh, on the, in the floor area. The, I guess you would call it a basement area. And I was sleeping in the bed. I was about to, uh, we had all gone to bed. There were three of us in the house. And um, my sister had said goodnight, and brother-in-law said goodnight, and they were upstairs, and I was just about to uh, go to sleep. Just as I got up, I got up to go to the restroom, and uh, I was thinking about my mother very strongly. And I came back from the restroom, and I know with absolute certainty, 100% certainty, there, my sister makes an incredibly, uh, you know, detailed bed type thing. It's very, you know, it's the beautiful throw, the whole nine yards, everything was immaculate. And I came back from the bathroom, and I was the only one that had been on that level of the floor, and there was uh, one dime lying on the bed just as where I was about to lie back down. And I know with certainty it was not there before I had gone to the bathroom two minutes earlier. So there was a dime there on the bed. And I thought, well, that's my mother's message to me. And I sort of started trying to tune into her uh, mentally. And I lied down on the bed and I was lying on my right side. And I felt a touch on my left elbow. At the same time, there was a touch on my left elbow. I felt a very gentle touch in the middle of my forehead. So I was being physically interacted with, I felt, from a presence, and a very loving presence at that, um, on my left elbow as well as my forehead. Just at that time when that was occurring, and I was just sort of enjoying, if you will, the comfort of my mother, I heard um, from a very large dresser that where my mother had um, stored her her. Uh, important items that she had kept in her life and the clothing that she had. Um, my sister and brother-in-law had given her this beautiful dresser, a very large one, to put her stuff in. And way in the bowels of this dresser, I hear a, a noise, and the noise I hear is an electronic noise that sounds like an alarm going off, and kind of a do-do, 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 do-do type thing. And I, and I listened for that noise, and then it quietly faded out. And then I fell asleep because I felt as though that my mother was in the room and it was very nice knowing that she was there. And uh, so I went to sleep. Next morning I got up, told my sister and brother-in-law my experiences of the dime I felt on the bed, I found on the bed, the touch I felt, and then the noise that I heard. My sister said, what noise? I, I, don't, know what my, I don't know what her mom would have in the dresser um, that would be, you know, making noises like that. So we go into her dresser and way deep into the dresser we find a little alarm clock. And my sister said that while my mother had been living there for the last six months, um, she had never taken that alarm clock out. My sister had never heard it making that noise. So it was very, very interesting that it decided to make that noise that evening when I found the dime and felt a touch. So we just took it as a message from our mother, who we always really have felt that she is always still around. And so then I went on to my uh, trip to Oregon. I was driving back roads from Colorado to Oregon. And um, I was driving in, Feb in um, February, and I was just entered into Idaho on some back roads, and um, my vehicle started having uh, a transmission problem, uh, either clutch or transmission, and it was not wanting to shift properly. And uh, the weather was beginning to brew. Lots of, I was listening to the radio, and there was a large potential blizzard snowstorm coming across that area of southern Idaho. And so I decided oh, I'm just going to pull my car off this road where there was no traffic whatsoever. It's about midnight, and um, I was just basically waiting for the flurry. I, I saw it beginning to flurry, and just I thought, well, I'm going to be in the middle of a snowstorm here with a broken down car. So I just said to myself, oh, what will be will be, and I'm just going to kind of ride it out, and whatever happens, happens. And just as I was having that thought sitting in my car, I hear that little electronic beep, 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 because I had taken that electronic device with me. I was going to take it with me to Oregon as a keepsake of my mother. And sure enough, just as I had that thought of I'm just going to go with it, what will be will be, it's all going to take care of itself eventually. Then way back in one of my suitcases in the trunk of my car, I'm hearing the beep, beep, 
beep, beep, beep, beep. Just I think my mother letting me know she's there, everything's going to be okay, and it worked out beautifully. Not to fear, everything worked out very well. Anyway, that's just one story. I have many, many others, and some much more dramatic than that, having seen apparitions and others, and I will be calling you back. Thanks, Tony. Wonderful program, and uh, much success to your program. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, I've heard of pennies from heaven, but mm-hmm. I'm guessing dimes would be ten times better. Ha, ha. Yeah. Ha, ha. <laughs> I think when we get those messages from someone that, someone that has passed on, you know, the timing of it is, I think, half the message. Because sure. the timing of it alludes to we know who it's from. It's deciphering the rest of the message on our own. So I am glad that it worked out hearing the alarm clock in your car going into a potential blizzard in Idaho in February because that that would have just yeah i would have ended up a made for tv movie and i've been found three months later as a popsicle <laughs> like the dookie hauser family in that one uh, yes years ago. just like that now if someone can tell us the name of that actually i could probably google that and figure that one out pretty quick people are still telling us about the one i was describing like 80 episodes back um okay i can't tell you what it is off the top of my head but it's been stated to us 50 times um but I remember the Dookie Hauser one where they like they froze their toes off and he walked through the blizzard and blah blah blah. Yeah, that's what I think of growing through that. I came pretty close to having that happen to me once. Yeah. I mean, just and I had no messages from beyond the grave. It would have been nice. It would have been nice to have somebody going, "Hey, it's going to be okay." Now, I, I was driving a Taurus uh, through the Upper Peninsula of Michigan on just two lane roads through a blizzard trying to get to a funeral actually it's from my uncle's funeral uh-huh. um and so it's one of those time sensitive things where either i plowed through and did it or i was gonna miss the thing so it was like okay and i was young and stupid i was probably like 22 or 23 and thinking oh i can do this with a tourist two-wheel drive uh-huh. somehow i did it i mean i don't know i mean I've gotten stuck with a four-wheel drive F-150 in our driveway in Kansas before. Right. But somehow I made it through a blizzard with lake effect snow driving along the coast of uh, Lake Superior in Lake Michigan uh, through a blizzard. I don't know. I don't know how I did it to this day. I mean, it was very dumb because there's long stretches of nothing in that area. Just hills and nothing and trees and animals and bears and oh my and i mean there was times where i didn't know where the road was i could tell that there was a i was basically on the right path but the the snow had gotten so high that i mean the the plowing was so intermittent that it just piled up on the roads and i thought okay well there's trees you know about 20 yards that way and tw- trees on 20 yards that way the road's going to be generally in the middle of all of that so it was kind of trying to calculate that for the best I could see as the snow is falling, going down a hill. And it's like, well, if I stop now, my car's going to just keep sliding. I can't really get out. So it was like, it was car skiing a couple times. Horrible. Oh, man. I made it. I couldn't even imagine. I'm one of those, if we get three inches of snow and school's closed, I'm yeah. not going anywhere. I should have just stopped at a, a gas station or something along the way and just kind of taken refuge. But I did it. I, don't, I mean, I made it, but I made a what would should have been a five hour trip, an 18 hour drive because I was literally going about 25 miles an hour. I bet your poor parents were a wreck. I don't think they were aware. Oh, wow. Until I got ba- I got home because yeah, there was no texting at that time. Sure. It, it was just like, well, there's a snowstorm and I'll, I'll make it, you know. Um, I mean, they were pretty you know distraught about my uncle passing. Sure. Um, so I don't think they were as aware of what I was going through until I got there. And I, I, uh, when I finally got into like out of it, I was able to tell them, Hey, I'm really late. Cause they were wondering where I was. Um, and like, I just went through a snowstorm. Okay. Well, be careful. See you a little bit later. <laughs> we'll have an old fashioned when to get here. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm going to need like 10 of those. Uh, but oh my God, that way to this day, I, once I, I pulled into the parking lot of that, I never thought I'd be feeling relieved pulling into a parking lot of a funeral home uh-huh. you know but i was just like ah, i'm here yeah um but to this day um any bad weather i mean i don't chance it at all anymore remotely like i did then but i still am like nothing will ever compare to that 
I mean, just nothing can beat that story for me anyway. I don't know what I don't know what could beat it. I don't, I don't know, know what worse unless I was in the exact same situation again. The only but, thing I can compare to is when there's a freak ice storm in Texas and watching Texans try and drive on ice. Yeah, yeah, uh, that would be kind of scary. I guess maybe a mudslide trying to drive through mountains or something and being trapped in it as they're going down. and That would be horrible. That would be very horrific and scary. Yes. But this is, I think there was just as much danger with this. You know, I could have easily just gone off. Anyhow, that was my non-ghostly but scary as hell driving story, everyone. And there you go. Winter Driving Awareness Day. Not really. Okay. No, I don't know. There was some other. What was the other suggestions we had the other? Apparition awareness. Apparition awareness. That could be one for maybe December or January or something. And there was yeah. another, wasn't there? Yeah, there's spirit something. Spirit. Uh, it's on the message board. Anyhow, we'll figure out another month after October. <laughs> we need another reason to have rulers. <laughs> Uh, there you go. Uh, become an EPP. If you're not one yet, please support the show. Let us keep doing the show by becoming an EPP. You get a bonus episode every single week with some of the best ghost stories of the week on it. And it's not like a repeat or anything. These are fresh ghost stories only for the EPPs. Um, calls to full-blown show. Really good stuff. Uh, and our EPPs have been saying really nice things about it. So they're very happy. Please become one. Support the show. Five bucks a month or you do the 60 bucks a year. Whatever works best for you. And you can other... Like you're going to have access to our uh, video that we're making, a short film, Spirits in the Air. You can have access that, to that months before everybody else. So please uh, please support and allow us to continue to do this show for you. So for Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening to another episode of Real Ghost Stories Online.